Welcome to the center of the universe and the home of the 18-time Grey Cup champion Toronto Argonauts. This is the X's and Argos podcast with Ben Grant and JB. Welcome to the X's and Argos pregame walkthrough brought to you by Something in the Water Brewing. Ben Grant joined as always by JB and we are here to get you set for the biggest test the Argos have faced all season long going into Princess Auto Stadium to take on the first place Winnipeg Blue Bombers. We got a lot to talk about today. There's a, you know, last week we talked about the trade deadline coming and going. It turns out Maybe there was a deal. We'll give you some of the details on that, what we know. John Hodge uh, coming up with all sorts of uh, information on the P.J. Walker trade uh, and what that might entail. Uh, Plus, a couple big signings this week. Uh, Sage Dockstader, the most interesting of those offensive linemen drafted by the Argos in 2021. We'll get into that. Uh, Simon Chavez, the long snapper in this week because of an injury to Adam Adam Guillemet. Um, the Argos releasing Justin Marshall and also Benoit Marion signing in Saskatchewan uh, made some headlines. And uh, of course, we'll have our usual assortment of stuff, including pick six, our game preview, injuries, OCDC, one thing, predictions, put me down for 20, and our CFL picks. All that and more is coming up on this episode of the X's and Argos podcast. Before we get into things, JB, this is the perfect time of the year to go down to something in the water brewing because they've got so many beers on the go. They've got stuff that they bring out every fall, some really good ones that you've got to get out in there and try. Of course, there are all the classics there as well, Longboat Pale Ale, of course, uh, but they've got award-winning beer that is available to you all year long as well, and some non-alcoholic beer if, uh, if that's uh, what suits your, uh, your occasion. So if you want to head down to something in the water, it couldn't be easier. It's steps from Lamport Stadium, uh, where the Argos practice, steps from BMO Field. And of course, with the final home game of the Argos regular season coming up, you got to make sure you make plans to get down there in a couple of weeks time when the Toronto Argonauts host the Ottawa Red Blacks. Hopefully we will see you there. Okay, JB, let's get into things. Let's let's talk about this, this PJ Walker deal. So this first surfaced as a Calgary story, and then it turned out there were some Toronto ties to it. And so from what we can gather, and John Hodge doing some great reporting on, on Three Down Nation, uh, you can you can find his story on Three Down Nation. It's the headline story right now, probably will be for a little bit. There's great information in there. I'm going to kind of give you a, a little bit of a summary, but for the full story, you got to go check that article out. So uh, I'm going to read you a little excerpt here, and then maybe, JB, we can kind of break this down and, and, and talk about what well, there's a frustration that I want to air first, but then, you know, what th- this deal might involve. So uh, this is from the article. Um, Hodge writes, head coach and general manager Dave Dickinson revealed that the Stampeders acquired the rights to Walker a few weeks ago in a trade with the Toronto Argonauts that wasn't announced publicly. Sources have indicated to Three Down Nation that the Stampeders gave up two negotiation list players and a conditional draft pick to acquire the quarterback's rights. Uh, and then he goes on to say that uh, that Walker was offered a contract by the Argos, but he didn't want to join a team that didn't have uh, that had a starting quarterback under a long term contract. And Calgary seemed to be a better fit for him in terms of becoming a franchise CFL quarterback. So, first of all, PJ Walker, a really interesting player, seven year NFL career, and the fact that he's looking to make a name for himself in the CFL, that he's picking and choosing a place where he can be. A franchise quarterback. I think that's really exciting for the league. So maybe that's where we'll start off. Having a guy like Walker come in, um, I, I think, is, can only be a good thing for the CFL. I mean, he's he's a legitimate NFL quarterback. He didn't, um, you know, I I don't think he was a full time starter in the NFL, but he certainly was good enough to be. I mean, I'm sure he'd be good enough to be a backup. Uh, I'm surprised nothing really opened up for him, um, but. It it does speak, I think, to the CFL's increased status that it's seen as a place not not necessarily Siberia, but a place where you can rehabilitate um, your reputation a little bit, or or you know show you know that the film you shoot here is going to be taken seriously. So I think that's you know that's an interesting argument. I don't think he's given up on the NFL. I think he's here to try and get the NFL's interest again, and he you know. He, he definitely has a lot of talent. I mean, he, you know, he, uh, you know, he's, he, he runs well, he throws, he's exciting to watch. I think, 
I think there's uh, lots of reasons to believe that he's going to be really successful up here. And he's been on a few different teams' negotiations lists. I remember a list being released. It must be like, it's got to be three or four years ago. I know Ottawa had him on the, one of their 10 names that got released publicly. Uh, and then obviously Toronto uh, ended up with him on their list as well to be able to make this deal. That's my frustration. Like the part of this, I hate, I hate any kind of like secrets uh, in pro sports. I just think everything should be out there. I understand why it's not in the case of the negotiations list, but but even like the trade, like I, I want things to be announced publicly. I, am I wrong for being frustrated by what seems uh, like like secret transactions at times? Okay, I mean, we we have from time to time joked about it. it, it it's, a, it's an aspect of the CFL that doesn't make any sense. It seems to be like a throw over from when they kind of were their own league um, and didn't answer to anybody. But, you know, not knowing when the trade deadline is, teams making deals that are not released, you know, <laughs> the, the, you know, the lack of clarity on, you know, what does questionable mean on, in the injury report and, and who's going to play on, on game day. You know, these are all aspects that I'm sure drive the sports books crazy. Uh, but drive us crazy because this is a professional football league. There, there should not be secret trades. You can't even have a secret trade in fantasy. Um, you know, you can't even have a trade without the whole league being aware of it. I, I don't understand how it's it's possible or even allowed to to have this deal. And I guess because like and it, it this happened a few weeks ago, according to to what David Dickinson said, it, it's wasn't signed that people notice because there are no new players arriving, right? So you don't, it's not like, you know, you're trading negotiation list names and you're trading draft picks. Like those aren't things that suddenly appear on your practice field. But I guess with PJ Walker imminently arriving, well, I guess he, his whole family had arrived in Calgary. And so I guess at some point, something had to be said about why PJ Walker was suddenly part of the Stampeders. But yeah, it just, it seems strange to me. Uh, and I don't know. It's it's been a source of frustration for a while. I get the I get the negotiation list part of it. I do get frustrated by that, but I understand that. But yeah, trade like this is just strange to me that we wouldn't well, have had I mean, some knowledge of it. Yeah, obviously, like coach would be upset if at every press conference they're like, "If you end it with coach, any secret trades that we should know about?" <laughs> yeah, you know, just just checking in. If there was a secret trade, we'd love to know. Yeah, that that wouldn't that wouldn't go over very well. No, um, of course not. Because it's like, well, I mean, I don't, I don't think it's, you know, not to get too, you know, too on our high horse here, but you know, I don't think it's unreasonable to to have to have a trade deadline which is written out uh, and is on a clear date, and uh, and to have trades that are made between teams um, announced and not just simply like written on napkins and shoved into pants. I wouldn't think it would be Toronto that would hold back on this. Like, I think that I, this is probably coming from Calgary. But again, I don't know. This well, is, I'm it just should have run through from, the league office. I mean, I think the league well, office. Yeah, it obviously did. They would know. At the, but, well, I mean, at the end of the day, the league office is the ones who should, who should announce it. So, I mean, uh, it's more amusing than anything truthfully. yeah like it, again it's not it's not a sort of like there's nothing to be angry about it doesn't impact right now but it is interesting and I, I i'm really intrigued by this i would love to know the names of of well, the, the players coming well, back because you want to be excited now that about we a trade have made the secret trade you know partially um you know uh no longer top secret can we have the redacted names please yeah um, and and I guess the draft pick is conditional, so we won't know that for a while. And I, ga I gather that that is based on whether or not Walker becomes Calgary's starter down the road, and so that would that that might change the value of the draft pick, obviously. So so I, I guess you know we can't have that. I don't think we're going to have those things filled in. Um, and even, until even conditional is you know a conditional seven, a conditional one. I guess I mean, we'll conditional find it. Is, it covers a lot of ground. Well, it's a pretty big range, though. If you are getting someone that is going to end up being your starter, your franchise quarterback, that's obviously worth a lot more than if you get someone that comes right. in for a few that's weeks. What, that's what I'm saying. I mean, like, like, you know, I think you know, like, depending on you know how much playing time they play, what what does that conditional turn into, and and who are the? I mean, I you know, I I I don't think there's. I would assume 
for a player of this skill um that that the price was was a decent one that we were able to get from calgary because they're they're in a relatively desperate situation um you know and uh, the argos are you know very effective at trades uh i would i would bet that uh I bet the price that was paid was was decent one. I would I would very much like to hear what Calgary gave up. Well, that's what I'm really interested in. I think that's the next part of this that's exciting for Argos fans is those two names coming back. It's not like like there's no way that the front office for Toronto is just like, yeah, just, you know, send us two guys on your list. Like they they have two guys that they've looked at clearly. And not only are they interested in, usually if you're trading for names that uh, they, or you know, negotiation rights to someone. Generally, uh, there's got to be a good feeling within your organization that we can probably get this guy. And I think that that part is exciting because remember, it was only only a couple of years ago where Toronto traded Nick Arbuckle to Edmonton and got back the rights to Chad Kelly. And shortly after that, Chad Kelly signed with the Toronto Argonauts. Um, I think they got a, they got a second round draft pick in that deal as well. Which and now they've got Nick Arbuckle also. So. Um, that that obviously worked out really well for the Argos, and I wouldn't be surprised to see the Argos come away with something good here. And then we'll see what that what that draft pick turns into, and hopefully it's a really good draft pick for for the league and for Toronto. It would be great if it's a, a high draft pick because that means that he is Calgary's guy, and I think he'd be an exciting player to watch in the CFL for for years to come. So, um, and let's not dismiss the importance too of the fact that the UFL is as seems to be struggling. There's a lot of talk this past week about how that league may not be financially viable going forwards who knows if this might be the last season coming up so uh, you know that th- this is uh, a player that you know maybe in in years past would have just stuck down there and and played ufl football but um maybe that factored into his decision to come up north so yeah that's i'm interested by this i'm intrigued by it i can't wait to find out the rest of the puzzle which i'm sure we will at some point but uh, it's not going to be today uh, Sage Dockstader, Toronto's 2021 second round draft pick has finally signed with the Toronto Argonauts. I, for one, am thrilled by this because you have no idea how many DMs I get on a weekly basis from fans who want to know any news on Stage, Sage Dockstader, any news on Jared Wayne, <laughs> any news on Luigi Valen. I get a lot of these. And so Sage Dockstader finally signs with the Argos and the timing couldn't be better. Isaiah Cage has been down with injury. He's on the six game injured list. We don't know his status, whether or not he's going to be able to make it back at some point. I like to think so, but uh, to have Canadian depth on the O-line is never a bad thing. And he's a real quality uh, football player, a quality offensive lineman. So it, it's huge to get someone like Doc Stater uh, into an Argos uniform. You're gonna. You're not gonna weigh in on that, JB. I felt. I felt your answer was pretty comprehensive. I can. <laughs> I mean, I can. I can echo huge like a monster truck rally. Yeah, let's do that again. Huge, 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 huge. Perfect. All right, I will continue then. Uh, I got a chance to watch him at practice, and he's wearing sixty-three. Uh, some question as to like, I wonder whether or not long term he's going to be a tackle or a guard. It's tough. Like, remember with Doc Stater, in like specifically with Doc Stater, he didn't have the typical Canadian high school experience because he was Canada football prep. And so they're playing American rules, American schedules. So even in high school, he's not playing with that that yard off. And then he goes to New Mexico State and he doesn't have obviously he doesn't have that Canadian neutral zone. And then he's with the New Orleans Saints uh, and uh, and then with the XFL, UFL. So. It is very new for him. It is the transition to the Canadian style of play. And for a tackle, it is especially difficult. We see Americans struggle with this all the time. And we have to think of Doc Stater as an American in terms of his football background, because that is what he has played. And so it is going to take some time. And, you know, I can even see that at practice, uh, some frustration, you know, where he's out taking reps at like the right tackle spot, for example, gets beat around the outside because the angles are all different. It was great for him to, you know, to watch him go back and not only has he got uh, Coach Sweet there, but also guys like Landon Rice, he spent a lot of time talking to and and just kind of working through, okay, well, you know, what would I do with my footwork here? And I, I don't know exactly what he's saying, but it seems like they're talking about feet. It seems like they're talking about hand placement. And I have to assume that that's due to the learning curve that there's going to be now with that extra yard of space. So I'm excited about him. This is not going to be a, like this week thing or, or next week thing. 
Hopefully, though, you know, the Argos have signed guys that this time of year in the past that have come into play late in the season. I think we're thinking long term. I think we're thinking next year. But if he shows well and if Cage's injury goes on for a long time, who knows how this is going to maybe factor in down the stretch and, and into the playoffs. He's a quality offensive lineman and he has played almost exclusively left tackle uh, since he was like 15 years old. Uh, but he's got that flexibility to be able to play on both sides of the line. He could transition inside to guard, uh, maybe as a stopgap, as he kind of learns the uh, learns to play that tackle spot. Kind of like what we saw with Ryan Hunter. Like remember when he first came in? I remember watching his first game in Calgary. He had been a tackle too. Remember he was he was a a left tackle at, at Bowling Green and then um, and then played some guard in the NFL. And he arrived same situation late in the year. A, a, a Argos draft pick that played in the NFL. And he came in, his first rep at tackle looked, looked terrible. Uh, he looked lost. He looked like he'd never played the position before. Meanwhile, he was a great tackle in the States. It's just that that transition is so tough. And so they bounced him inside the guard. He's been playing there ever since. But now they had him out at tackle last week. Looked great. Um, and and he's. He, I, I have no fear about having Ryan Hunter out there at left tackle now. And so with Doc Stater, don't be surprised if you see him inside first before they maybe transition him to outside. But it, like with the guys they've got under contract right now, you know what excites me, JB? They have the potential to be able to, at some point, if they really wanted to, to go five Canadian linemen and have a good five. Like you could do that. And I, I know you got Dijon Allen under contract and he's not going anywhere and he's a an outstanding player, one of the best in the CFL. But the idea of if you had like Doc Stater and, and Hunter on the outside, um, and then the three guys, any of the three of the six, seven, eight guys that they use in the interior, that's a, that's a good line. And it's all Canadian. It gives you flexibility to do other things. Um, I just think that's kind of cool. Yeah, I mean, it would be amazing. I think it gives you, I mean, most teams are heavy there, but I mean, it would, you know, you might find a, an inefficiency if you're able to to steal one more spot on that line. And, um, you know, potentially he might be able to come in and be like an extra lineman in run plays. I mean, he is a huge individual, as we went over with my echoing voice. Um, you know, so like where where the maybe the pass pro takes a little while to get used to. You know, he can definitely, uh, you know, pick a guy up and push him against his will. Uh, I I wouldn't be surprised if we got a little a little taste of that as they as they gave him some gameplay. Yeah, and I think he's I think he's lost a little bit of weight. That'd be my judgment call. It's hard to tell. These guys are in such good shape now. Like he's he's like six foot eight, but he's listed. I think the Argos listed him at three fifty. I don't think he's that right now. I would I, my guess would be somewhere around that three thirty, three twenty five mark now. Um, and if he's not, then I would suggest just keeping him as he is because he looks great. Uh, he looks he looks uh, fit and still a giant man. So. Um, you know, whatever he's carrying right now, I think is a good way, but I don't think it's that 350. But yeah, just that size, that extension, and he is a good run blocker. I'd love to see him out there as soon as they can. Yeah, I would love that as, as, on the edge, you know, like sealing down um, some, you know, some poor linebacker. Yeah, so we'll, we'll see when he gets out there, but I think this is a very exciting move for the Argos long term. And yeah, we've been waiting for this one for a while. So yeah, I'm I'm as thrilled as anybody. It's simply for the fact that I don't have to answer any more questions about it. So now it's left to uh, Jared Wayne, I guess, and uh, and then I can give my DMs a rest. Uh, the Argos this week signed Simon Chavez, uh, University of Guelph product. Uh, had been on a couple of CFL uh, rosters as a long snapper. Adam Guillemet appearing on the injured list was limited today, was limited yesterday. How big a deal is this if Chavez has to get in the game this week against Winnipeg in that stadium with that noise? Is a long snapper someone that we're maybe going to notice in watching this game? Yeah, I, I mean, on some level, you would think that they are relatively replaceable, but uh, I think the reality show is much like a holder. Uh, it's, it's, it's like a timing and, and a feel and those guys spend all practice working together and they know each other and they know exactly where it's coming in and the speed is coming in. And, um, yeah, I, I look, that's potentially a problem for sure. It is, you know, whether it's coming faster than you expect or lower or higher. Um, I think there's going to be an adjustment period there. Uh, and, um, you know, it, I, it, it is one of those things where you really like to have guys. You, you, you'll you notice most teams, they don't 
they don't really stir that up. You basically have like the same long snapper for like 15 years. Um, because when you find somebody who can do it, you're really happy with it. And yeah, it's, it's a bit of, it's a bit of a, a concern for sure. I think you, you would have to highlight that and hope that, um, you know, they're able to do it because it just, it's just not that easy, much like kicking field goals. It, it doesn't seem very complicated until you need somebody to replace the guy you have. And, you know, suddenly it, it's much harder. So yeah, I, I mean, I'm not super concerned, but it is, it is a bit of a worry um, for sure. He's still a pro level guy. And obviously this is a big opportunity for him. He's going to do everything he possibly can to be ready for this uh, potential opportunity. We'll have to see. We don't know for sure that, that Guillemette's not going to be able to go, but I, I think it's, it, it suggests that he won't. The fact that they've brought him in, if they, I think, if they felt like you know what, he's going to be able to go, um, you know, maybe they bring him in anyway, just to have that extra, you know, to be able to rep it at practice. If you're not going to have him out there long snapping at all, then maybe that's it. But yeah, I, I would, I would be surprised just based on having watched this kind of thing happen over the years. I would be surprised if Chavez is not out there as the long snapper on Friday against Winnipeg. So we'll see. And yeah, hopefully he has, hopefully he has a great game and uh, and he can earn himself a job going forward. That would be. The That'd be great to see. Well, yeah, and if you're going to make a change, now is a good time for it, and not uh, say the week of the uh, of the playoffs. Yeah, that's true. And and to have a guy in at this time of year too, because if something did happen down the road, now you've got another guy that has worked with these guys in the past and and knows the system, and, and, et cetera. So, yeah, this is the the time to do it. Coming off a bye as well, uh, with a long week of practice in front of him, I think that's all ideal. Uh, other moves that were made, uh, receiver Justin Marshall was released by the Argonauts. Uh, we never really got to see too much of Marshall. He had that that great touchdown catch in Montreal. Fun to watch him in, in the preseason. And, uh, you know, he was a player, but this receiver room is getting healthier. They're going Canadian on the field side where you've got so many bodies now back with Brissett back and Neald. And, of course, Mattal, that they're trying to work in there somehow uh, to go along with, with Unger and company. It's, it's just a very crowded receiver room. And with only two American spots, really, uh, it was a move that, that had to be made. So sad to see him go, but um, not surprised to see him go. And then Benoit Marion, uh, after signing out twice with the, with the Ticats, uh, was released again. And it looks like Saskatchewan has picked him up. And so he is reunited with... Uh, Corey Mace uh, with the Rough Riders. Okay, that is all our week's news. And now let's get into our regular stuff, JB. Um, we'll, we'll start with the pick six, which is brought to you by Something in the Water Brewing. If you haven't taken advantage of this yet, you got to try it. At some point during every week, we put out a tweet asking for your questions. And so you get on social media, ask your question. If we pick your question to answer on the podcast, you win a six pack of beer from Something in the Water Brewing. You can try some of that Longboat Pale Ale. And so this week it is Adam Bucci, who's question we are using and I chose this question because it kind of segues us into a topic that I wouldn't mind just opening up a little bit uh, was something that we haven't discussed much uh, which is is you sports related so Adam first of all congratulations you've won a six pack of beer from something in the water and here's Adam's question JB he said I was at my first college football game the other day and there were about six no yards penalties some other close calls my question is is that normal for college football or is that something that doesn't really happen often so first of all, no yards penalties in U sports. It's not something that happens a ton. Penalties generally aren't a huge issue in U sports. They're about the same in, in every league that you watch. Again, refs sort of compensate for the level of play. If you watch you watch little kids play football, they're not throwing flags on every, every single play. They could, and they're not though, because they want football to be played. And it works all the way like that up to the CFL too, where you're going to get about the same number of penalties. That said, it, it doesn't guarantee it. We had the other day, um, the uh, St. Mary's Huskies and Acadia Axman put up 328 combined penalty yards. That's a, you know, that's a rivalry game. It's a little bit different, maybe. Uh, you might see some some heated play, some tempers flare up. So 328 yards of penalties is not your normal um, college football game. And just as six no yards penalties is pretty unusual. I can't imagine the special teams coach was very happy with that. Uh, unless they were desperately trying to guard against a returner and they're just like, you know what, take the penalty. Let's not risk that ball coming back the other way but yeah that that is an unusual experience and I just wanted to say if you have thought about watching some OUA football in and around the city of Toronto if this is a great season to do so you've got 
Uh, York winning some football games, being competitive. And so you can go out and see them. They're close by uh, the U of T Blues, of course, as well. But if you get a chance to watch Tyler Elgersma, uh, Taylor Elgersma, sorry, um, he's a really interesting guy to watch and has Argos ties. Remember that Taylor was with the Argonauts, not this past camp, but the two camps before that as part of the QB internship program. This past year, he spent training camp with the Hamilton Tiger Cats. I'm telling you, he has got a CFL level arm. I said it two years ago. I was really interested and excited by this guy. What he's doing right now in the OUA is awesome. Like watching what he did to Queens, who is a quality team and program, and he just dismantled them. He looks fantastic. He he stands out as much as I've seen a quarterback stand out in the OUA in a long time. Um, it's that sort of Will Finch level kind of play that uh, that you don't often see. And so Algersma, I expect to be a high CFL draft pick. I expect him to get a shot to play quarterback in the CFL. If you get a chance to watch him this season, uh, it'll definitely be worth your while. So um, yeah, aside from Taylor Algersma, there's a lot of great stuff happening around the OUA. It's really good competitive football. If you get a chance, go out and watch it. Okay, JB, let's get into this game. Uh, this one's huge. Give me your initial thoughts. Going into Winnipeg, Friday night, it's the first game of the CFL weekend. It's big for the Argos. The Winnipeg Blue Bombers with a win or a Saskatchewan loss can clinch first place in the West. The Argos are a point behind the Ottawa Red Blacks for second place in the East. Obviously, Montreal's, they're, they're gone. They've already clinched. They've wrapped up uh, first place in the East. But that home playoff game is still a possibility for the Argos, especially with a head-to-head against Ottawa coming up. Uh, fair to say this is the biggest game of the year for the Argos? Absolutely. Um you know, I think that it it is, in all sorts of ways, it is a measuring stick as to where they stand. You look at Winnipeg, who just, uh, you know, really took apart uh, Hamilton. And if, if Toronto considers itself, you know, a playoff contender, a great cup contender, this is absolutely a measuring stick game. Um, having to go to Winnipeg and take on, and you know, a team that has spent the second half of the season being the odds-on favorite to win the great cup. Um, so I think that's really important. I think how Toronto, even though they've shown an incredible ability to to bounce back this season, that's kind of been tempered with an inability to kind of keep the hammer down and to kind of string together a couple of really strong games, which they were able to do the year before. So I'd love to see them, you know, be able to repeat and, and be able to kind of show that, like, look, this is a level of, execution that we that we are now achieving at um it's not just kind of we we can do it one game and then not do it the next game and they get yelled at and then we can do it the third game so i think that will be important to show that toronto can can maintain a consistent level of of effort um and and then you just look at the standings it's huge i mean it, it, a win here absolutely puts toronto um <laughs> uh, in in the pole position you know, to 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 have that home playoff game, to to qualify, to to really go on a run in the playoffs. I think it's not must win, which takes a little bit of the heat out of it, but it it surely would be a fantastic win if they were able to do it. And and I think it would, I think it would send a real message to the league uh, about Toronto's um status and maybe even get them in the CFL power poll above uh, Edmonton. <laughs> they, yeah, dare, they, dare to dare to dream, but they're, maybe they're still they're, I think they're still behind the Hamilton Tiger Cats in the last <laughs> power rankings that I saw, which again is I don't know. I, I don't know what to say about that. But yeah, this is this is a, a an opportunity. This is a great opportunity for the Argonauts. The, the Winnipeg Blue Bombers are the best right now. I don't think there's any question about that. They are the best uh, amongst uh, betters. They're the best amongst anyone involved in any power rankings. And you just have to look at what they've done. Like you said, like they have dismantled teams several weeks in a row, and. No one has really been able to play with them for a while now. This winning streak that they're on is now eight games in a row or something like that. Plus, you add to that, they're playing at Princess Auto Stadium. This is an extremely difficult place to play for everybody, not just the Argos, but the Argos specifically. I'll get into some numbers on that. But this is a place they've only lost five games since the pandemic at home. They just do not lose uh, with home field. And they've already had their loss uh, quota for for this season. So this is going to be tough. It's sold out. It is going to be 
very noisy. Uh, that stadium holds its noise uh, as well as any other stadium uh, in the CFL. So yeah, it is tough. And to look at some of those numbers, this series is fascinating because they're Toronto has played Winnipeg very well outside of Winnipeg, but not that well at all in Winnipeg. Uh, the numbers are, are pretty stark. They haven't actually won a game in Winnipeg since 2015. In 2015, they won a 27-20 game, but everything after that in Winnipeg has been a loss. Some close, some blowouts. But take the Blue Bombers out of Winnipeg, and suddenly it's Toronto who are dominant in that series. Uh, Winnipeg's only got one win in that series outside of Winnipeg going all the way back to 2018. And so, uh, yeah, generally the Argos beat the Blue Bombers wherever else they are. And they've had the TD Atlantic game. They've played, of course, at BMO Field for most of the other ones. But uh, yeah, in Winnipeg, it has been tough going. So this is a chance to exercise some demons like we saw them do in BC a few weeks ago. And uh, one that they're still trying to, trying to take care of in Calgary. But uh, yeah, I think this is a huge opportunity for the Argonauts uh, to to really set the tone. Because after this, Toronto's got that game, uh, their last home game of the regular season against Ottawa, and then they go to Edmonton. What you would love to set up is you win this game this week, you beat Ottawa, and now you can do whatever you want. You basically created a buy for yourself at Edmonton. If that's how these next two games go down, you've created a buy. And now you can rest whoever needs that extra week of rest. The Edmonton game doesn't matter, uh, and that's what the that's what the Argos have to make sure they um, they do. They take care of business. Now I'm assuming some things with Ottawa and stuff, but I, I think that's generally how that will go down. All right, uh, let's let's actually just before sorry just before we get into the injuries here uh, and look at the Winnipeg side of this because I think people may want to know like is this a game that matters to Winnipeg yes and no so they've got a buy coming up after this week so I do think you're going to get the full you'll get that full uh, Winnipeg look the game does matter to them they would love to wrap up uh, first place in the west before going into their bye week so yeah it does matter and then their last game of the season's at montreal i know montreal is going to be resting guys but winnipeg wants to be able to do that too so this is really their chance now the other way they can get in is saskatchewan losing but saskatchewan's only got two games left and one is at home against bc one's at home against calgary they're they're going to be favorites in in both of those games so as winnipeg you want to take care of business they you're going to get a good, ready Blue Bombers team in this case. All right, let's get into the injury report. Uh, For the Winnipeg Blue Bombers, they got a ton of guys that appeared on the injury list today. This was day one of practice for them today. Uh, They are not coming off a bye like the Argonauts, and they had a bunch of guys on there. I can't tell how banged up some of these guys are. I know a few came out of the game last week against Hamilton. Most of them didn't, though, and so we'll have to wait and see. I think tomorrow's practice will be a much better indicator but right now you got lucky whitehead didn't practice with the ankle injury nick dembski didn't practice with a knee injury ontario wilson didn't practice with a head injury that is three receivers uh, from the receiving core that did not practice today Uh, and then gabe wallace offensive lineman uh, and uh, brandon alexander the other one that stands out with the hand injury um, the uh, the defensive back the hard-hitting defensive back um, who is going to be part of my ocdc but uh, we'll have to wait on his status here so i made a a last minute change on that so those are winnipeg's injuries for toronto it's far more simple you got a couple guys set out from practice yesterday either for illness or personal reasons Today, it was it was pretty much full go. Fraser Sopic not able to practice with a hand injury either yesterday or today. Adam Guillemet, like we already talked about, was limited yesterday and today. And Tande Adelike is limited yesterday and today. Everyone else was a full go. And that's Adam Boye, that's Dejan Allen, that's Woody Barron, Brandon Calver. Uh, all of those guys were full go. I don't think we're going to see Barron or Calver yet. But good to know that Allen is um, is fine and is taking care of whatever it was that needed to be taken care of yesterday. So the Argos are in a decent spot. Of course, they've still got 12 guys on the six-game injured list uh, waiting for them. But it's as healthy as, as Toronto has been, this has been their status all season long. So the injury report uh, isn't bad considering how we've seen it some weeks for the Argonauts and they're coming off a bye. It is time for OCDC. <laughs> JB, I'm going to get you to start things off first as the Winnipeg Blue Bombers defense. Uh, what is your plan for shutting down the Toronto Argonauts this week? 
Yeah, it's interesting. Um, you know, Toronto has become a little better. Um, but I think that there's still some books out there on them that I that I agree with. I think that Toronto's red zone issues are an issue. Um so I'm 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 probably more keen on playing a bend don't break uh style in terms of letting them move the ball between the twenties. Uh you know, of course you have to score because you can get field goal kick to death, uh, which we've seen. So it's not a it's not a strategy without without flaw. I think if you're playing Toronto, you you essentially you have to score, you know, 27 points. I don't, I don't think you're, I think it's going to be very hard to keep Toronto um, low scoring when they're functioning as well as they are right now. So for me, uh, I'm going to, you know, try and keep that Chad dagger ball under wraps, um, you know, force him to throw the underneath stuff. Um, I, I might try and run blitz a little more than teams have just to try and keep Toronto a little honest with the run. I'd love to keep the run under a hundred. Um, I, I don't I don't think it's hard to convince Toronto not to run. So uh, you know I think if you if you have a couple of successful stops that seems to impact the the coaching decisions a little bit. So I, I would probably mix in a little more run blitz to keep that run under a hundred. Um, you know have the the two deep safeties to keep Chad's um, deep dagger ball under control, and uh, you know and really sort of hope that my team can score touchdowns while I hold Toronto to field goals. And I'll switch over to the offensive side of the ball for the Winnipeg Blue Bombers. This is this is a tough matchup for Winnipeg. As good as Winnipeg is and as amazing as they are at home, Toronto matches up very well against the Blue Bombers. Don't forget the Argos beat the Blue Bombers earlier this season without Chad Kelly. They just happen to do, they, they defend the things that Winnipeg does very well. And if you look at how these teams stack up, especially in terms of rushing yards, I think it would surprise some people to see how much better Toronto is than Winnipeg at both running the football and at defending the run. Those those numbers stand out. The Argos are number one in the CFL in rushing yards per game. They are number one, uh, sorry, number two in the CFL in average game per rush. And then defensively, they're the best at stopping the run. Uh, they give up the least yards per uh, per rush uh, least yards per game on the ground. And so Winnipeg's offense is very much predicated on the notion of being able to run the football successfully. That's where the passing game opens up. They have a very classic attack in that the run opens up the pass and they're able to run successfully against most teams. And then they start to open up the passing game and then they finish it off with the run at the end. That's that's their formula. And so as Winnipeg, uh, I'm going to I'm going to try and do something that maybe throws the Argos off this week, because what I can't have as the Blue Bombers, I cannot have the Argos shutting out my run entirely because that's going to make it very difficult to throw the ball. That's what happened last time these two teams played. And so for Winnipeg, I'm going to come up with some sort of designer runs, basically runs that Toronto hasn't seen specific runs designed for this game that is going to catch Toronto off guard stuff that we haven't seen, maybe getting Oliveira a little bit more to the outside than we typically see perhaps some misdirections some counters that we don't often see uh, the blue marvers run we, we've seen them run counters but in ways that they haven't maybe using jet motion and then counter off of that just to get toronto to have to adjust to something that they haven't seen at all this entire season on film because i think it's really important for winnipeg to get that run going and then once they do get that going once there is some success running the football now you go back to the stuff that you're good at and the play action crossers and the the quick hitters into the slot receiver where you're bringing guys in and you're going to test though that sam linebacker position you're going to test that will linebacker position areas where toronto may have some vulnerability based on injuries that have occurred and you're going to look for those those hooks to uh, your inside slot receivers and and glance routes and and all the rest and of course you've got to take some shots down the rail that's just a given at some point you're gonna to have to challenge the toronto corners see if they can stick with their assignments and go deep all right let's switch it up jb we are the toronto argonauts coordinators now how are you calling this d for the boatman well, um, Winnipeg, you know, you look at Winnipeg, they are um, <laughs> a problem. Um, they're very well balanced. They run the ball really well. Uh, Caleros is a veteran. He He's not going to be confused by much that you throw. 
Uh, their offensive line pretty good, picking up sacks. It, it, it is a challenge. I think that you look at their defense. Their defense is elite and has been since the beginning of the season. So that's not a late developing aspect. I think that the the Winnipeg's defense is performing at such a high level right now. Uh, you know that 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 is um, you know a little terrifying from from Toronto being able to 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 slow down. Winnipeg, I think, you know, I think that uh, y- y- you're going to have to take care of the run first. Um, I I think they feed off Oliveira more than any other team uh, feeds off their running back. I think it, I think it's it's more emotional for them. I I would put more concentration on Oliveira and really kind of clamp down on him, um, and and really trying to keep him under under 75 yards, uh, which is not easy because he is such a hard runner. He's like Olette in his prime uh, last year. You know, he is a hard guy to control. But I think if you if you put the attention on that, especially at home, um, I, I think that you can, you know, you watch Kenny Lawler. He loves to, he loves the deep pass. I think you keep a special eye on him um, in, in passing situations. But but from a passing point of view, the they don't scare me the way Oliveira does. I think if you can keep Oliveira in check and you can avoid the busts that lead to 50-yard Lawler touchdowns, uh, I think you're in okay shape. They did well getting to Zacharias last time they played five sacks yeah. in that game, as I recall, right? And that that was the 16-14 win. You don't. It's that's he, a, he Claris is definitely playing better now than he was then, though. Agreed, and they've got their offense is running so much better than they were. But I do think getting after him can lead to some success if you can get home. Though that's the thing you have to because if you don't get home, he's going to burn you so badly, and and that's the the concern there. So I yeah, think- it's 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 a tough assignment. I think you can get, especially when you're playing in Winnipeg, it can feel, you know, it can feel like your your water is coming in from all sides because Oliveira is tearing you for six yards. And, the, you know, and he's getting up and he's pumped and the crowd is going crazy. And then you load up on the run and then bloody Caleros hits a, you know, 25 yard in. And now it's like, well, we can't stop the run. We can't stop the pass. And it, it sort of snowballs and it becomes really hard. I think you have to, you have to have the discipline to say, well, look, we're going to stop the run and we're going to put the pressure on the DBs to to make some plays back there, but we are going to stop the run. I think Toronto doesn't have to sell out to stop the run. They're, they're good at stopping the run, but I would put a little more juice into it. Um, and if you can if you can take some of the heat out of the running game, especially with Winnipeg at home, uh, I, I think it lets you be calmer about Winnipeg's weapons, which are not... You know, like if you look at the roster, it's a good roster, but it's not a roster that should leave you thinking, how on earth are we going to stop these guys? It, it's just this feeling of water coming in from every direction when when Oliveira gets going and, and Caleros is smart enough to take apart what you're doing. You're not going to outthink him. Um, I think you just have to force Caleros to beat you. Going to the other side of the football Toronto's offense, I I would do something rash here, uh, something different, and I know well, that's really? risky. I would because I know Toronto's been playing well the last three games. They've they've had the offense going. They're coming off like a 500 yard game against the the Montreal Alouettes with 234 yards rushing. This is how I'm looking at this. I think you I, I think you want to try and get Winnipeg guessing a little bit. And the way that I think you can do that is changing up your tendencies again. Remember that they have already established the run. That's what's nice about this. They, they're coming in with three straight games of being able to run the football very successfully. And so to me, I don't actually think you need to establish any sort of run. I think Winnipeg's going to come into this one saying, we got to stop that run because if Toronto gets running and we're guessing up here, we're in trouble. And so I think they're going to load the box. I think they are going to be hell bent on stopping the run. And I think the passing game is going to be a bit of a vulnerability for that Winnipeg defense. So I think you come out passing because you look at what they've established. So four games ago was where we were very critical of Ryan Dimity for only running eight times against the Ottawa Red Blacks, eight times for 61 yards. Since then, 36 rushes against the BC Lions for 165, 23 rushes against Hamilton for 139, 
30 rushes against the Montreal Alouettes for 234 yards. Teams are terrified of Toronto's run game right now. And so you don't need to run it to sell run. Play action will work from the word go because Winnipeg is looking for run. And so that's where you take advantage. Heavy play action. Uh, You're going to be very pass heavy early on. And don't be afraid to take deep shots too. If you can get... DB's quarterback watching or or looking to the backfield off of jet motion, off of whatever kind of run fake you can put there and just cause even the slightest hesitation and take a shot down the sideline. I'm up for that too, but I think you can pick them apart in the passing game. And if they start backing out of that and start emptying the box, now you go back to them the other way. So you don't need to set up the run, hit them through the air from the very beginning of this game throw the ball 40 times. I'm fine with that this week. I think that is a recipe to beat the Blue Bombers. All right, JB, it's time for one thing. Uh, what's what's your one thing this week? We've been terrible at hitting these. I feel like we don't hit these ever. And it seems to have no... no, no it's almost like there are no, golden no, fleeces attached to it. Yes, it, it does. We are not good at one things, golden fleeces, or CFL picks. So uh, those are the segments that we're coming into here. What is your one thing, JB? Get <laughs> two of our four segments we're not very good at. Um, <laughs> well, my one thing is is Claire's under seventy five yards. Um, it's not not easy. I think that Toronto under seventy five is... yards passing. I'm oh, sorry, sorry. Um, oh, Oliver, Oliver, Oliver. Okay, I was gonna say like uh, they're not no. gonna keep Claire's under seventy five <laughs> no, yards sorry, passing. Good luck. Got a little mushy there. Yeah. Uh, Oliver, I think you keep Olivera uh, under seventy five yards uh, rushing. Um, I, th- I think it's doable. I think I think you know I don't think it's a pipe dream. I think that the the the, the personnel is there, um, and I I just don't see them losing if it happens. I can see them winning without that. I mean Toronto has won some wacky games over the last little bit, um, but I think that that it puts them in a in a really good position. I think that uh, you know that the, the secondary has come along here and it's it's time to. You know, like I talked about, I'd love to see Toronto kind of perform at an elite level a little more consistently. And I think that the run defense Toronto has is elite. And I'd like to see them kind of flex that muscle a little. My one thing is going to be keeping Chad Kelly upright. One sack. That is all you are allowed, Toronto Argonauts offensive line. That's all you can (laughs) give up. One quarterback sack. If you can keep Chad Kelly on his feet, I really like Toronto's chances. If they're getting home, if they're if Toronto's having trouble communicating pre-snap, I know they had the the crowd noise going this week at practice uh, down at Lamport, uh, and that's going to be big if they can keep the communication up because Chad's not going to be able to change the plays the way he he might. He's not going to be able to change the protection, and if he starts doubting what's happening in front of him and starts. Uh, getting nervous in the pocket. This is going to be a, a long night for the Argos. So the offensive line, this is big for them. They have to be able to hold up. And uh, and they do have the edge of maybe Winnipeg looking run. It's not the same. I think it's hard for some people to understand like the difference between a defensive line rushing looking run first versus expecting pass. It's very tough to transition from one to the other. If you were a defensive lineman expecting run and now suddenly you've got to turn on the Jets to get there to get home as a pass rusher, it is far more difficult than when you're just able to pin your ears back and and come at the quarterback. So the Argos have a little bit of an advantage, I think, that way, but they have to keep Chad Kelly on his feet. How's this one end, JB? Uh, this is this is a big game. Uh, I'd love to hear your prediction for it. How do you see this one going? Uh, you know, uh, I I am going to put my faith in the team. I thought that 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 last win was a turning point for them. I thought it was a well balanced, um, well coached, well executed win. Winning in Winnipeg is uh, incredibly challenging, but Winnipeg. It, it isn't do or die for Winnipeg, and and you can't fake, um, you can't fake it. Toronto wants this win more than Winnipeg. I think Toronto needs this win more than Winnipeg. Winnipeg is essentially half a step away from clinching. Um, so I'm going to give it to Toronto, and I'm going to give it to Toronto, uh, 35-31. Uh, I'm I was. 
very close to going with the Blue Bombers here. And there were a lot of factors that would have made me lean that way. Had Toronto not been coming off a bye, I would have gone with Winnipeg. Yeah, had, that's, a, that's a nice perk. It's a huge advantage. Had Because you know, like the coaching staff has been eating Winnipeg film for the last two weeks. There's no chance they haven't been. And so they're going to be as prepared as you can be. This game's so big. Toronto still hasn't clinched a, a playoff spot, remember? Like Winnipeg has is, is not only clinched a playoff spot, they're a point away from from winning the division, Toronto is in tough. Like you said, they they are going to want this more. The coaching staff is going to be ready for this. Had Winnipeg lost in Hamilton last week, I think I also would have picked Winnipeg, but they're they're in a pretty secure position. I like where Toronto's at. I think that, I, I actually think Toronto at their best is better than Winnipeg at their best. The tough part is going to be you're playing in a really tough environment, but I think Toronto is going to have just enough to be able to pull that out. I think they win by a single point. I've got Toronto 28, Winnipeg 27. Uh, I think it's going to be a great, great football game. Yeah. I, I just know that it, it absolutely is coming down to the fourth quarter. There is no chance it does not come down to the final play. You know, the last one went into overtime. So, you know, maybe, maybe this one does too. Let's get into put me down for 20. Uh, JB, oh, this yeah. is, this is, we may as well rename this segment. Here is my 20 golden fleeces because uh, it's been rough for both of us. You, you especially, but I have not been doing well yeah, lately. Yeah. Um, you've dropped 14 of 16 and yeah, I, I've, I've been a, a lot of misses, missed both of my bets last week. So I'm back down to 221 golden fleeces. You are at 114.5 golden fleeces. Uh, I will take honors this week. So uh, I've got two bets and they're really simple ones. Uh, I really like the Argos plus three and a half. uh, And so I am putting 10 golden fleeces on that. I think it is going to be a field goal game. Even if the Argos lose, I think that three and a half covers. And then my other 10 golden fleeces, I am putting on the Edmonton Elks at plus 100 against Calgary. I just don't, I don't think Calgary should be favored. They're favored by a point and a half. And so I like Edmonton uh, on that money line for even money. So uh, those are those are my two bets. Uh, easy peasy. Where are you going with your 20 golden fleeces? Well, I, I've, I've, I'm going to take a small intermission from throwing my money down Elk Canyon. <laughs> um, and I'm going to move towards uh, Chad Kelly throwing over one and a half touchdowns at plus 120. Uh, I think Kelly has a nice game against uh, against Winnipeg, and uh, he, I, my other money is going to go into Montreal. I I think Montreal is going to send a message to everyone. Um, you know, we talked about are they going to play hard? Are they going to throw the game? Uh, I agree with you. I think that this is the probably maybe the last game that they go 100. percent I have Montreal uh, clearing 14 points at 210, or sorry, 250. I get 250 uh, if Montreal is able to win by 14 points more against Ottawa. Uh, Ottawa's leaking oil. Uh, Montreal is not going to be very happy with how that Toronto game went. Uh, I think I think Montreal comes out here and uh, drops the hammer on the on the Noir et Rouge. Yeah, you're adding like 10 points to that spread, but I I don't mind that. I think you're right. Like they they can't have been happy going to the going to their bye week after getting just blown up by the Toronto yeah, Argonauts. Those, and, and and I find the spreads are um, pretty. Uh, um, I, I don't know what to be non-competitive. I'm I'm not totally like I find I do find the spreads are very modest in in when they're often put up in terms of teams playing each other i mean i think that should be much more i mean 14 obviously is a lot but <laughs> it is. Uh, i i do i think i think ottawa is has been found out and i think montreal is going to have one last flex of the eastern championship before they they start getting ready for the the playoff game yeah well i think this is their last big home game right like they've got one more coming up but i think they're gonna be resting guys like this is their last opportunity yeah, to be you like can, yeah Here you we can are. miss me yeah. So no, my, I, my fleeces, my my family's fleeces are are on the line. So if we if we are freezing um, at night, then we will know who who not to put our faith in. 
And as a, it's a good good segue into reminding uh, listeners that you should not take any of our wagers very seriously. As we've clearly illustrated, uh, we cannot be trusted to make bets for you. And so uh, do not put any of your hard-earned money uh, on the line. Only bet what you're happy to lose is the cost of entertainment instead of taking our word for it. Uh, let's get into our CFL picks. Uh, I was two and one last week. You were one and two. So I am at 42, 26 and two. You are at 35, 33 and two. Mm-hmm. And so it is time for you to turn it on. And it's time for, for me to go uh, ice cold as I did last year at this time. And you caught me and, and mm-hmm. beat me. So um, we're pretty much in the same situation we were. So I'm just going to try and not completely blow it here. Uh, I'm going to go first and give you a chance to really take some risks, JB. Toronto at Winnipeg. I'm sticking with my guns. I'm going with the Argos. Uh, what am I writing down for you? Yeah, I will. I will also, uh, you know, karmically not not hedge there. I, I I like Toronto there. Edmonton at Calgary. I'm going with your Elks. Uh, how much faith do you have in the oh, Edmonton God. Elks? Uh, I I mean none yet. I consistently choose them. Um, I know if I don't choose them, they will win by forty. But I'm going to take Calgary at home. I think Jake Meyer. Probably has a little fire lit under him. He's going to put some film out there because looks like he is not going to live in Calgary next year. And then BC at Saskatchewan. Uh, This was the toughest one of the week for me. I'm taking Saskatchewan here. I think this is going to be a pretty good game. I would not be surprised to see BC come away with it. Where are you going? You know what? I, I was on the fence too, but you know... It's moving day. I'm going to take the BC Lions. That's that's a that's a decent that's a decent uh, pick to try and make some ground up on you. And then Ottawa, Montreal. I'm taking the Alouettes. Uh, what yes, is as, your pick? as well. I, you know, I mean, who knows? But I, I think that Montreal drops the hammer there. It's going to be a good one this week. Friday night, 8.30 Eastern Time, Toronto Argonauts at the Winnipeg Blue Bombers. And of course, you can catch it on TSN 1050 if you want to hear Mike Hogan and I with the call. That will just about do it for us on this pregame walkthrough episode of the X's and Argos podcast. For JB, this is Ben Grant saying so long and may all your pre-snap reads be good ones. I'll see ya.